You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Pro Tour Phyrexia is in the books. What happens when the pros try to break the Pioneer meta? We take a look at the latest technology from a star-studded field. After that, 12 cards are on the ballot for our next monthly project. You decide which card we brew next. All that and more is coming up. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, coming to you from the Twin Cities, and I am joined by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is Caden Online, Daniel Schiever. Dan, what's going on? Hey, David. I'm doing well. It's good to be with you here on Pro Tour Weekend. Pro Tour Weekend. Yeah, it uh, took a little break, a little uh, siesta, but it uh, it has returned, and people have been excited about it. It's been kind of uh, heartwarming to uh, to see. Feels nice to say that again. As I talk to you right now, I have a second screen open with the gentle sound of cards being obsessively flicked through a player's hand. <laughs> it's like a little rhythm. You miss that. You just yeah. don't get that with the digital only stuff. I actually think they have to turn up the mics higher so you can hear the flicking more. Like, I feel like it used to be you could really like hear, you know, like when Shota would make a play or Luis got a you'd hear like the and then <laughs> put the card like you he actually could hear it a lot crisper. I've been kind of tracking that. I've been watching on and off throughout the weekend, and there are some feature matches where you can actually hear the banter pretty clearly. They put the mics pretty close, and you just like hear like a random comment that Reed Duke makes to the other player he's he's playing against. But then there are other matches, like when uh, Shota Yasuoka is playing, where it's just like it's like you're watching a silent film, you know, or <laughs> like a a tutorial, <laughs> like a YouTube tutorial where they sped everything up. So that you're just seeing the essentials of like how to do this the best possible way. <laughs> no words are exchanged. Nothing is communicated. And it's actually very difficult to tell like whether a shale dread trigger has happened or not because, uh, you know, they have to have someone manually update, you know, what the life totals right. are. But it lags behind a little bit and you can never really tell like, did, did he get that trigger or not? Well, and the thing is, he doesn't ever miss triggers. And I used to think it's like, okay, you know, he's Japanese. I know he's not fluent in English, so I thought that was part of it. But when he plays other Japanese players, he also doesn't speak. He still communicates, you know, through like hand gestures. You know, of course, he plays at a million miles an hour with this incredibly precise play. But uh, even as he was crushing his uh, his uh, Japanese opponent, who I think was on mono white, he was just like, mm -hmm. he's just brief little hand. Like, oh, okay, I'm down too. All right, you're dead. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, he's he's gonna he's gonna destroy you uh, regardless of your uh, native language. I guess is the lesson. So does a master. Yeah, I think he has now tied, or he's either tied or moved past Kai Buda and Luis Scott Vargas on all time. He moved past them was the announcement, which is surprising to me. You know, the longest rub for a while is he, of course, had the respect of the other pros. You'd hear Luis Scott Vargas and uh, multiple other people speak very highly of him, but they say you just didn't have the finishes. A lot of it was because he was not a great limited player. All pro tours, basically, since he became a pro, involved limited. And, you know, if you 2-4 limited, you have to really have a perfect uh, record in standard or modern or pioneer or whatever to make the top eight. And I don't know if he just, people have gotten worse at limited. The sets have gotten easier to play limited. He's gotten way better at limited. He's joined a team where he like picks someone's brain. Like, I don't know what the process is, but like he's 6-0 limited in this tournament. And then the fact that he's, you know, among the better uh, actual constructed players of all time um, has like shown through. And now you wouldn't say like the argument was he didn't have enough finishes for the uh, Hall of Fame. And in fact, when he was elected, he was really on the lower cost, but it was like because people had so much respect and now he's got more finishes than you know we think of these people as slam dunk uh <laughs> yeah hall of fame he like tease right i mean uh, louis scott vargas uh kai Bud, i mean these are these are you know first ballot people and i think he was tied with nasif and nasif added one as well later on uh nasif top eight as well so i think he's he's feeling the uh, hellhounds on his on his heels 
I think that's number 10 for Nassif. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. So, yeah, congrats to all of them. Amazing competitors in the top eight. Shoji Asoka, Reed Duke, Gab Nassif. These are household names. And Nathan Stoyer, the current world champion, a name you should be getting to know. If we had the Pro Tour for the past couple of years, you would know his name uh, for sure by now. He's crushing everything. Yeah, this is a worthy return to Pro Tour play. I've enjoyed it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we saw in the metagame, some of the technology, <laughs> to the extent that there's new technology. It's just good to be back. Yeah, well, before we get to all that, we need to, of course, take care of a little housekeeping. We want to welcome our newest patrons, Kale M, sounds very healthy, mm -hmm. and Deckard. Uh, I love the reference there as well, if, if it is a reference to what I think it is. Um, I don't know that reference. What is Deckard? You don't know Deckard? Should I know Deckard? Deckard is the uh, name, uh, the last name of Harrison Ford's character in um, Philip K. Dick's. Um, You've lost me completely. <laughs> if it's not the Fugitive, it, then I don't know <laughs> what we're talking about. It, in, Bla in Blade Runner. Uh, in Blade okay. Runner. Gotcha. So uh, I don't know what his first name is, actually, now that I'm thinking of it. Uh, everyone refers to him as Deckard. I believe Deckard is his last name, though. Gotcha. Um, okay. So Blade Runner, a spectacular movie, 1982. Blade Runner 2049 is super underrated. It's actually just amazing. Uh, I don't know if anyone, if, if they're on our... Um, patron, they've seen my list of underrated films, and I also submitted a list of like my favorite films of the decade, and certainly um, Blade Runner 2049 is among I think one of the better movies, and in general, the the director there also did Dune, Dune 2 is coming out this fall is like the one of the few people still kind of keeping alive, the like James Cameron, George Lucas Steven Spielberg dream, like these mass entertainments that are still actually spectacular movies Oh, interesting Okay so I'm assuming this person is referencing Deckard. Uh, I just looked it up online. Rick Deckard is his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, a patron of taste and culture, for sure. Yeah. Both Kale and Deckard, thank you both very much for your support. And as always, a reminder that if you are enjoying the show, would like to support us, the best way to do that is by going to our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Among the benefits that you will receive is you get access to our wonderful Discord community. Brews are always flying there. Always great to see what people are working on, see the ideas iterated on. And occasionally, you know, we see some pretty sweet 5-0s coming out of the Discord. Another benefit is you can vote for cards. From time to time, we have a monthly project in which people can nominate cards. We open that up to all of our patrons to choose what card we work on next. And that's actually one of our topics for today. I see 12 cards have been submitted this time around. We'll tell you all about those later in the show. Absolutely. So on to the business at hand. Pioneer was the format of the Pro Tour. There were only, there was like the smallest Pro Tour in like a decade and a half or something. So there weren't that many competitors. It's 200 and some. Yeah, I think because this is the beginning of the, the new new Pro Tour system, they haven't seeded it yet with carryover qualifications. So they're just like going out on the street and grabbing people like, would you like to come and play a tournament? We got to put butts in seats here. And I think the Hall of Famer thing, you only get to like one a year. And so many Hall of Famers are choosing to use their uh, one on the format that is not Pioneer is kind of my understanding. If they didn't like the format or had mm, time to practice the format, they wanted to wait for standard or, or modern or you know whatever. I, I Obviously, each Hall of Famer is making a decision on their own. But like Martin Yuza got in through his Hall of Fame qualification, um, maybe because he likes Pioneer. Maybe he's just excited to play in a pro tour. But I know a lot of other Hall of Famers chose not to participate in a specific tournament. Maybe you don't want to go to Philadelphia in the winter. That's That seems pretty reasonable to me. <laughs> it's a terrible, <laughs> terrible city. <laughs> so a small field, but 200-some players turning their attention to Pioneer. What did they come up with? I mean, I think that over the last five, even ten years, we've kind of given up on the dream of the pros breaking the format. It just doesn't really happen. Um, many of them have talked quite openly about they they no longer consider that a good use of their testing time trying to come up with a new decks. So 
I didn't see that much new. I mean, there's some iterating on flex slots on the known archetypes, but there are only like three, maybe four decks that I feel like we hadn't seen before. Yeah, which is kind of be to be expected, right? When when Pioneer was the qualification format, people just jammed, you know. Luckily, there's a bunch of different archetypes that are, you know, in the tier one or two, and people try those, right, over and over again. And if they kind of like the gameplay of those existing decks, they like the format. And if they didn't like them, then they didn't. And uh, the the Pro Tour uh, deck selection of, of the uh, pros reflects that type of attitude towards the format. So we're just going to tell you about a few lists that caught our eye, uh, either for their novelty or for their you know, unique approach on known archetypes. And we got to start with Shota. Shota Yasuoka, Hall of Famer, world-class player, a bit of a lone wolf. I mean, they say that he doesn't test with anyone. They say that he doesn't even test at all, that he just sort of theory crafts. He looks at the format, identifies what he sees as holes or opportunities for attacking, and just builds his deck the week before the tournament or the day before the registration is due, often a control deck, although today he chose Rakdos Midrange. So what did Shota find? Well, it's interesting. It looks at first kind of like a stock list, but the difference in it from the other lists is is minor, but relatively meaningful. He's playing 26 lands. I don't think I've seen another Rakdos list play 26. He's playing three Mutavolts. I think typically they play zero. Mm-hmm. Um, Reckoner Bankbuster main deck is something that we have actually seen. Uh, Misplaced Gingers is, is one of the, like respected grinders of the format he's been main decking one or two for a while um he's main decking a single duress which is uncommon he's main decking two lilianas which is uncommon i'm still trying to figure out what he cut i think it's additional two mana removal he's only playing two dread bar one power word kill uh and then it's become very standard i think to replace some number of graveyard trespassers with the record or bank busters he's only playing two trespassers and that's kind of been the number that i've seen from people I've seen some lists playing as many as three copies of Reckoner Bankbuster. Shota only wants one, and he's not playing any... Well, correction, he's playing one additional copy in his sideboard. But I feel like the Mutavolt is the most telling thing. It seems to me like Shota has identified that what, what Rakdos needs is the ability to apply pressure. And just watching him play when he was on camera, he attacked in a lot of situations where I personally would not have attacked. Like he just, he didn't even think about it. Well, I'm sure he thought about it, but he just like automatically started turning everything sideways. Maybe identifying that, you know, the reason that Rakdos can be successful is that it doesn't really give opponents that much time. You've got to put him on the back foot. And the Mutavolts went a long way towards that. He's also playing two Misery of Shadows main deck where some builds are playing zero, some are playing a Croxa instead. Um, some players are playing, you know, as many as three Castle Lockthwains, showed us playing zero. So he's not interested in playing this long card draw game. He's a little more interested in just getting them dead. Yeah, Kroxa is by far the worst card in the entire deck. No one should have ever been playing any. So that's the easiest cut. Maybe just getting rid of those makes your deck way better. You know, Misery Shadow is the card that gives you your matchup against Mono Green. So, you know, people piss and moan all the time about how Mono Green needs to get banned. Then they won't play the cards that are good against them. So it's like, all right, I'll just play Misery Shadow. It's really good against them. To your point, it's also a very aggressive card. In the linear matchups, it's it's good against Mono Green. It's good against Lotus Field. <laughs> uh, you know that last turn when you need to kill them, you just tap for your mana and the treasure that your um, Fable token makes, and all of a sudden, you know you've you've sped up the clock by a full turn or something. Um, yeah, you know Reckoner Bankbuster. All these cards are super grindy. I I think Red Black really misunder misunderstands its role. It's very easy to outgrind Red Black. Uh, I talk about it all the time. It's hard for Red Black to win matchups where the polarization is happening. That's one of the reasons why Fable's very good in this deck, right? It turns your Fatal Pushes and whatever. So he's reduced the mana cost. He's playing Duress. Again, that's a very easy exchange. And he's he's adjusted his deck to be good against the polarized matchups. And the thing that you have to do against the linear decks, and there's a bunch of them that top aided, is you need to disrupt their hands. He's playing five hand disruption spells, not four, plus two Liliana, which is super rare. So I guess seven hand disruption spells. And then he's also more aggressive. So he's somehow like, <laughs> he's short up all those matchups. And the only thing he loses is a little bit of quote unquote inevitability in mid-range grinding matchups, which only, you know, 
people in the <laughs> three one bracket in leagues play <laughs> where this is where I dwell. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe his list would be worse uh, against the types of decks that I'm often proposing. But you know, there's no <laughs> there's a reason I'm not on the pro tour. <laughs> yeah, and I think the last point to make is just that that mana base, the extra land, the twenty six land, and the three immutables. I think when Ragtos was becoming established, people were thinking, maybe I'll play 23, and then that quickly went up to 24 lands. And over time, we've seen that become 25 is now pretty stock. Ragtos is a kind of deck where I think Sam Black would say, it's not that you have to play 25 lands, it's that you get to play 25 lands. You get to have very consistent mana because your lands are so good that you know drawing extra lands doesn't really hurt you in Ragtos because your utility is always there, right? You have amazing creature lands or utility lands, such as Takanuma, such as Castle Lockthwain, if you want. Shota's saying, yes, I like all of that, right? Let's go even higher, right? He doesn't want to miss any land drops. But Mutavolt, instead of some of these slower utility lands, I mean, this just lets you be so mana efficient, right? If you're interested in chip damage, Mutavolt has so many opportunities throughout the game. You know, you, you spend two mana on a stomp, three mana on something else, and you have just enough left over with a treasure to like get in for two more damage. And you see him doing this over and over again. Once you identify that actually Rakdos is interested in that, then yeah, actually it makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't think I've seen anyone playing Mute Vault because, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I, I need to cast Blood Tithe Harvester on turn two, then it just wouldn't occur to you to put Mute Vault into the deck. Yeah, although to your point, when people were playing 23 lands, they had exactly the same number of red and black lands as show it, show it does. Exactly. Um, and to your point, Dan, about mana efficiency, it's not just about getting in with Muta Vault. It's also getting to play your fourth land untapped mm. all the time, basically. There's a bunch of times where your opponent can, like, play a Blood Tithe Harvester and stomp your whatever, or, you know, pay extra mana to stomp your Thalia and cast a Fatal Push, or what, like... So the extra land coming into play tapped happens all the time, where they, you know, on turn four have to just play a Fable and a tap land. That's a really bad turn four. And he just doesn't ever, or I guess significantly less commonly, has to make those types of plays. So he's playing the full four copies of Haunted Ridge that's untapped from turn three onward. Four Black Cleaves Cliffs, right? That's the fast land where it was not totally clear if Red Black even needed it, but Shoda would say, I like that so much, I'm playing all four, along with one Den of the Bugbear, two Hive of the Eye Tyrant. These are the lands that will be tapped from turn three onward, or turn four onward. Only two Blades have Pathway, that's interesting, and two Sulphurous Springs. So perhaps a recognition there that, you know, w because of the Muta Vaults, you don't want the full set of Pathways, you, you could commit it to too many single color lands. And then Urborg is uh, a utility land, but no Sokenzin. So he's definitely like thought about all these things, and he's, you know, made his trade-offs where they matter, and obviously it worked out very well for him. There were a ton of linear decks in this uh, tournament. And so his deck is very well equipped to deal with them. Yeah. So great job from Shota. And we'll see if this becomes the stock build of Rakdos going forward. The next deck that I want to bring to our attention is another one that made it to top eight. This is green, white auras, Selesnya auras from Benton Madsen. Auras, as we know, will typically rely on Light Paws Emperor's Voice and Sram Senior Edificer. These are your kind of two mana engine creatures. Together with a bunch of auras, but you need more than that, right? So you need additional threats, ideally one drops. That is a puzzle that the deck hadn't really been able to solve uh, in, in previous iterations. But things have changed, right? It's this new card, Skrelv Defector Might. I see four copies in the main deck, and that seems to be the key to the resurgence of Auras. Yeah, the fact that Skrelv is free is so huge. Um, you know, before they were playing the one mana, one one enchantment that had lifelink, and you had to spend a mana to sacrifice it to protect a creature. Uh, I, I won't, of course, think of its name. Oh, um... Gosh. All Slate of Life's Bounty, is that it? Yes, yep, exactly. So now you get to play Skrelv. Okay, Skrelv can't block, it doesn't have lifelink. That those are not trivial things, but fine. But if you play Skrelv mm -hmm. on turn one, they have to kill it and never even dream about getting a two for one with you when you try to enchant it, because on turn two you're just gonna play your SRAM, play your light paw. So you have to kill everything as it's played out. 
Uh, Skrull forces them to spend their removal inefficiently, and it is an artifact itself, so like all the glitters counts it, <laughs> which yeah mattered in a, in a game or two that I saw. So yeah, just a, just a really efficient card, and you know that Mother of Ruins type of effect is really miserable, uh, a miserable thing to have in Magic, and it makes sense that a card that mimics that is going to have a home. <laughs> so you're not a fan of Skrill as a card. I think they did everything they could to make this ability weaker. You can't use it over and over again uh, for free. You have to pay mana. Um, but in general, you know, th this is the kind of thing that when people play against, it's just, it's death by a thousand cuts. Like, you don't lose the game right then, but you eventually will lose the game. It takes people a long time to understand the play patterns. It is sort of a bolt the bird kind of a thing. And it uh, discourages certain types of interaction. Yeah. So in addition to the Skrelves, we see four Glade Cover Scout. That's the last Hexproof creature in the deck. A good sign for the archetype that is no longer playing that terrible two-mana Hexproof creature, the Basara Tower Archer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you talk about going from that to Generous Visitor, Light Paws, and Skrelve. It's just night and day. <laughs> the man is better. I mean, every, everything about it. I mean, what were we doing when people were playing Season of Growth and Basara Tower Archer? Like, I understand those were the best options, but those are not serious ways to win in high-level Pioneer play. Well, the deck was still very good against Red Black, specifically. It just couldn't yeah, beat anything else. That's true. Uh, so we see some new technology in the form of Audacity. Well, relatively new. That's from, I think, last set. Again, the mana base is another area where major upgrades have been made possible thanks to the Fast Land. Razor Verge Thicket, Temple Garden... This is a low land count deck. It's only 19 lands. And you see that after playing the full four shock lands and fast lands, uh, Benton Madsen's playing three mana confluence. Now, that, that could have been a brush land. But you might occasionally draw your one of Hammerhand or your one of Kaya's Ghost Form. And if you're going to be tapping the brush land for a damage every turn anyway, you know, might as well just play mana confluence instead. But you see the recognition there that, yeah, I, I may be playing several turns with access to only one or two lands, and I, I don't want to, and I need to keep my options open, basically, for spending my mana efficiently and using all my mana every turn. Yeah, and then the matchups, you know, this is a deck that is very good against red black, and it's very good against mono green, and those are the two most common decks in the format. So, you know, if you have a matchup spread like that, if can you fix the other matchups or can you dodge them? And the answer in Benton's case was yes. Yeah, uh, this deck is very bad against Thalia, it turns out. You, you don't think of green-white as a deck that's bad against right. Thalia, but this one becomes extremely clunky against Thalia. But it's such a it's such a classic metagame call, right? Like, red-black should chase out mono-white, and then I will beat red-black after they do that for me. Uh, and that's more <laughs> or less what happened uh, when in the games that I was watching. So congrats to Benton on the Pro Tour success. I see a, a Magic Online player, Rosty56, took the list and won the pioneer super qualifier yesterday with the exact same deck list so looks like this is a deck on the rise be aware of it i don't know if that means you want to register back to nature or something in your deck i'm not really sure <laughs> uh, how to account for auras yet but it's going to be a player yeah i mean the main thing right is you need to have cheap removal so the card like fatal push gets even better <laughs> uh than it had been um because you have to kill the light paws the turn it comes into play, and if they play Skrelv on turn one, that means you have to kill Skrelv on turn one. So you have to kill Skrelv on turn one and light paws on turn two. Um, and, you know, it's really hard for a normal deck to race those, that opening if you don't interact with it. All right, so those are two decks that made top eight. Uh, the next couple here were less successful, but still interesting and novel decks that I had not quite seen before. So I'll give them a brief mention here. This next deck comes to us from Nick Cirillo, who's Bob and Cheese. His tournament went up and down. He said on Twitter that uh, you know he started he started off one and four, but rallied back to make day two, and then he was six and seven at one point, but managed to rally with this constructed deck to get up to the nine wins he needed to requalify for the next PT. So congratulations to him, and he did it with a deck that I mean it, we can call it a brew. He called it a brew. It's a deck that I would not consider. Meta. It's basically five color Niv without the Niv Mizzets. Which is a bit sad to say, but when you look at the spells that it's playing, you see that very, very few of them are actually eligible for Niv Mizzets. And I think we've reached the point where, you know, the good cards in the format are no longer gold. 
Fable of the Mirror Breaker is better than any gold cards you can think of. So there's like not a lot of incentive to be filling your deck with gold cards that are eligible for Niv. So we even see four Bring to Lights. It's four Bring to Lights and zero Niv Mizzet. Instead, this is an Omnath to Light deck. A lot of the structure is the same. You have a lot of Triomes. You have a lot of Sylvan Karyatids. The Bring to Light package includes cards you'd expect, like, uh, you know, Valky, there's your one Extinction Event, your one Selfless Glyph Weaver, which can function as a, as a Wrath spell. The part where things get a little spicy is there's a single copy of Elish Norn, Mother of Machines. What does Elish Norn do when it's in play? One copy main, but you can bring to light for it. So there are certain situations you should be aware of that you can bring to light, get Elish Norn, and immediately follow that up with a Chain to the Rocks or a Leyline Binding. Four copies of each, right? So both of these are trigger removal spells, so you can actually have a huge catch-up turn. Get your Elish Norn down and immediately take out two of your opponent's threats. Elish Norn is also insane with Omnath. It makes a single land trigger Omnath's first two abilities, the life and the mana, which is otherwise very hard to do in Pioneer. Yeah, th this list has actually been around for a while. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a brew, but I've played against this list. I mean, this list has existed for a couple of years. The big additions are the Leyline Bindings, which is the main reason why Niv is gone. Leyline Binding, as you guys correctly identified when it was spoiled, was a huge player modern. And it basically means all these slow Triome decks, it is their fatal push, right? So it's actually good against Grease Fang. It's good against uh, random stuff. Okay, even against the, the list we just talked about, you can't hit their creature sometimes, but you can't actually take their best enchantment off the board because Leyline Binding hits everything. So Leyline Binding is the card that like tilts everything away from Niv and it rewards you for playing all your terrible lands. And the fact that Elish Norn, exactly like you're saying, makes Leyline Binding somehow even better, uh, like tips it again. And then the Chain to the Rocks, Fatal Push thing, they don't play a lot of Swamps. They do like the efficiency of Chain and Chain again goes up in value, exactly the lines you're describing with Elish Norn. So um yeah, the one of Elish Norn and the, the Leyline Binding are the, are the reasons that I think uh, that Niv is not part of the deal. And Omnath interaction with Elish Norn, which I hadn't realized until you just outlined them, is, is another thing. So I don't think it's the multicolored spells per se. I really think it's Leyline Binding's interaction with the Triomes. And the four Chained to the Rocks, which I typically would not expect to see both Chained and Binding. So I think that is the part that is yeah. maybe like the new innovation and it's such a catch-up mechanism, right? Like, you you play Omnath, they, whatever, kill it, and then you bring the light for Elish Norn, the next turn you spend, like, two mana and exile their entire board. It's like a super wrath that's one-sided because you're left with Elish Norn and it stops future cards from them, so. Yeah. I actually had tried this deck last night. Um, I was I added some Atraxas to it because that was the card we were testing from last week. Uh, it was interesting. I'll, I'll have more to say about it in our second show this week. But from Omnath to Light, uh, we move on to something that was called Blue-White Power Stones. Yeah, wild. So first of all, it's a Orion deck, um, and it's trying to take advantage of the fact that a lot of things come into play and leave uh, value. Specifically, the card Static Net caught my eye. So that's three and a white O-ring. And when it comes into play, you gain two life and create a tapped Power Stone. So what can you do with the Power Stone? Well, this deck actually has a bunch of stuff to do with them. They're playing four Disruption Protocol. So that's blue, blue, counter spell if you tap an artifact. So you get to play, in theory, the best counter spell in the format as long as you have a ready source of artifacts. You're playing fourth Raven Inspector, which makes an artifact to tap for your Disruption Protocol. Also, uh, you can use all your random Power Stones to <laughs> sacrifice your clues. Uh, Prophetic Prism, a card that blinks very well for your Orion. Also, you can spend a mana from a Power Stone into your Prophetic Prism. So your your oh. artifact token is a mana generator. So does that allow you to filter a Power Stone mana into a real mana? Yeah. Yeah. I see. So you have Portable Hole. That's a blinkable card. Glass Casket. That's a blinkable card. Reckoner Bank Buster. If you, if you prefer to have the cards. Uh, you can blink it again. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not in a hurry to beat them down with a 4-4. Four, four. Um, it also is another card that you can use your your uh, Power Stone on. A Might Stone, a Weak Stone is a giant Power Stone, right? So it taps for all these other cards. And then you have Karn, Sign of Urza to find artifacts. 
And then you have Metallic Rebuke. So all these artifacts lying around again, you get to play eight of the best counter spells in the format if you have enough artifacts. And this deck, you know, seems like it will. We just listed a million artifacts. And most of them have counter play abilities to go with your 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 Ryan. Yeah, I mean, th that's kind of it. It's it's strange. <laughs> I, I don't know how this deck did. I'd be really interested to try it out. I'd be interested to try it out without your Ryan to see if you can, like, find the actual good cards. Like, I... Love Karn Sign of Urza, and normally Dan convinces me to take it out of decks, and then the deck is just way better. <laughs> so I'd be tempted to do that again here <laughs> and find a different way to win the game. Um, yeah, just I mean, I've of course tooled around a lot with the Thraben Inspector, uh, Prophetic Prism, uh, Portable Hole kind of thing. I wonder if you could build like an Elish Norn version of this deck, so your static net gains you four life, exiles two creatures, makes two. Uh, clue stones obviously might sort of weak stone gets better with Elish Norn uh you know just something to think about but I'd have to see how this person uh did and I'd be curious to, like pick their brain on how they decided on the specific build yeah why aren't they playing Elish Norn it's almost like a, a budget build like they only had the hunter ticks rental limit or something and this is the best <laughs> that you could do they're like oh, I can't play the good card because <laughs> normally when you play Urian that's an excuse in my mind to play the better Karn because your sideboard's so bad in your eye anyway, right? You see the cards less frequently. Why not play a sideboard that's mm -hmm. full of artifacts to tutor uh, that are situationally very powerful, but um, they have four Monastery Mentor in their sideboard. Like, they're even going for a sideboard juke in their 80-card deck. So I'm not 100% sure on some of these choices, but I like the idea hadn't really occurred to me to, like, go almost in on, like, a control type of shell. Um... And of course, I was always trying to play some of the four mana planeswalkers that we've been a little disappointed with. Maybe you don't need those at all. Um, so yeah, just I, I I like a lot of the ideas here. It just seems like maybe too much is happening, or maybe they did awesome and they just you know did play poorly and limited, and and that this is like a new archetype. I, I I don't know how they did. I'm not sure either, and I'm far less than 100 percent confident in this deck. I'm like 20 percent confident in this deck. This looks really strange to me. I will say that I do think you have to play the companion, right? Because that's one of your payoffs for having power stones is that you, you get the free companion activation more or less. Uh, sure. And then, you know, I mean, there's four might stone weak stones. So that must be one of the, the strong cards in the deck. They're not even playing Urza. So they're only interested in the might stone weak stone half. Well, Urza is terrible. Uh, that's just. <laughs> sure. Sure. But. Yeah, I mean, if, if Might Stone Weak Stone is the card you're hoping to draw the most often, like, I want to blink it and I want to use its two mana to get my companion for free. But yeah, I mean, they're not playing what I thought was one of the better Power Stone generators, the, the one that you've been playing with, Stern Lesson. So yeah, Static Net wouldn't have occurred to me. Like that just seemed clunky to me, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, if you're going into your Ryan, it makes a little more sense. But yeah, I, I think Stern Lesson is a better card than many of the cards here. I've also played a lot with White Stone and Weak Stone, and it has been really bad. It is good against exactly <laughs> one deck, which is Red Black. And you're already playing your Ryan. Like, you should have a good matchup there. So I, you know, I, I have not found White Stone and Weak Stone to line up well against any other deck in the entire format. And I've started with four multiple times. This isn't just theory crafting. I played multiple leagues. Or my outcome is like, oh, I should cut down on my might stone and weak stones. <laughs> there, you know, it's bad against green. It's bad against mono white. It's not good against Phoenix. Obviously, it's not good against Lotus. Or I mean, like, just think through your head about all the matchups you might play. It's bad against spirits. It it doesn't line up well against any other deck. Like five mana draw two is not it. So if the minus five minus five isn't relatively <laughs> useful and it's only again only good against red black, then what what are we doing here? All right, well, kudos to Jeff Lynn for registering a sweet brew. Absolutely sweet brew. A absolute brew. Four Arch of Araska in the, graveyard, in, the, in the deck to turn on with all the clues, or the, the power stones. Oh my gosh. Okay, all right. I didn't even see that there. And then you can tap it with all the, <laughs> all the power stones. Four Storm Giants and four Arch of Araska. Okay, so there's something going on here. Two Inventors Fair. And the last deck I want to mention is an Is It Mind's Place Apparatus deck registered by Chris Botello, who is, you know, MPL, great player, uh, great streamer as well. Mind's Place Apparatus happens to be our card of the week. So we are going to have a whole session on this uh, coming up on Friday. So we'll say more about this deck then. It was just cool to see that one player was confident enough in 
the MySpace apparatus to actually take it to this event. Uh, I do not know how he did. I did not see his name mentioned much on the coverage. But uh, yeah, some promise for MySpace apparatus. I believe his build was more or less uh, is it Phoenix shell, but replacing the Phoenixes with MySpace apparatus. Yeah. Wasn't too out there, um, but maybe a vote of confidence, we could say, for the power of the card. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's kind of the brew report for Pro Tour Phyrexia. The return of the Pro Tour, a pioneer Pro Tour. We'd love to see that. We're going to shift gears now. Setting aside professional play, we go now into the land of brews. We've been working on Rivaz of the Claw for our monthly project, and it's time for something new, David. <laughs> no shade at Rivaz, although it's been hard to find match wins. It's been real hard. Not going to say more about Rivaz today. Uh, I might try, you know, one or two more things with Capricious Hellraiser uh, before we tie that off. But it is time to go through the nominees for next month's card. Yeah, so just a reminder, this is a benefit you get uh, of joining the Patreon at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And so you get to nominate the cards, and then people at, at, uh, who have joined at any level get to vote. And what do you get, three votes, Dan? Something like that, yeah. Choose your three favorites. All right, so the first card we want to highlight comes from Lurking Evil, and Lurking Evil has a nominated Rata Drabic of Urborg. A two white and a black, three three zombie wizard, vigilance ward two. Other zombies you control have vigilance. Whenever another legendary creature you control dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's not legendary and it's a two two black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. So Lurking Evil writes, far from seeing much play in Pioneer, Rata Drabic. Am I saying this correctly? Rata Drabic? <laughs> this is a bad name. <laughs> they, need, they need to work on this. Okay. Does, however, pack many interesting features. It is somehow resilient to removal. Great point with War 2. Plays well with other zombies. Uh, other zombies you control have vigilance. That's not a great Lord ability, but it's not nothing. Uh, and bring something new when you play legendaries and multiples. Uh, so yeah, if you play two legendary of the same type, right? Your second Thalia goes to the graveyard and triggers and comes back. And that second copy doesn't die. It stays as a zombie. Uh, with the number of powerful legendaries printed in the last years, I am sure that one could brew something worth talking about, especially with those who have a continuous effect or an ETB dying trigger. So this card is hard for me to wrap my brain around. I know that during the preview episode, we were intrigued by the abilities, but it's an odd mana cost. Four for a 3-3 three, three is, even though it has Ward 2, it's just not the type of card that we can easily slot into deck. So you really have to like work for this. It's a death trigger for legendary creatures. The legend rule can provide that. Actually, I saw some chatter about this card over the weekend. You know this hypothetical game people play where what's the most damage you can do without going infinite with just three cards? <laughs> I've heard of such a thing, yeah. And apparently there's a, a new contender for the most damage is Radadrabic plus... What's that legend? It's like a legend that doubles tokens, basically. <laughs> Oh, Mondrock or whatever? Something like that. And you just get like a cascading exponential amount of copies. It's a very, very interesting card. Definitely this would be a thinker if this is the card that people end up choosing. Yeah, what's the two-mana artifact that lets you sacrifice a creature of a type and tutor up a card of the same type that's one more mana? Pyre of Heroes, yeah. Yeah, that, that's kind of an interesting card with this for me. Hmm, yeah. And you don't you think okay zombie and wizard these are both relevant tribes but you don't need those to matter because you want your rathead drabic to survive so your other cards could all be of a similar type and if you could get your two mana or three mana legend to die with a benefit right you get the one mana higher on the curve and then you get the card that you sacrifice back and you're playing blacks so you get to play thought season push which are the best cards in the format so and there's something here yeah fascinating suggestion from lurking evil. Next up is All Will Be One. Three red red enchantment. Whenever you put one or more counters of any type on a permanent or a player, All Will Be One deals that much damage to target opponent or creature in opponent controls or planeswalker in opponent controls. Functionally any target, just not your own stuff. Nominated by Kon Kabalavkas, who writes that multiple infinite combos are possible in modern. Uh, he mentions War Elemental. What's the other one? Quest for Pure Flame? Is that another yep. infinite combo? Yep. 
There's potential for counter shenanigans, non-infinite instant kills in Pioneer, and Khan has mentioned some cards of interest such as Font of Agonies. That's interesting. Master Biomancer Wildwood Scourge. Hmm. Yeah, Font of Agonies is kind of interesting to me. <laughs> that accumulates counters every time you pay life, so yep. I mean you can you can rack up a bunch of counters on that if you want, with just Phyrexian mana. Or even the like, or even the one in a white, uh, one one. You can pay four life to make it indestructible. Because I'm thinking, like, when you cast this, you want to have more life than your opponent, right? So you're playing the the two mana three one. You get in a couple times, mm. and then you just resolve this and just indestructible four to you, indestructible four yes, to you. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to see how the three red red fits into that because I'm like, oh, that's a quick white black deck, right? I'll have my Font of Agonies and my Knight of the Ebon Legion on turn one, Adonto Vanguard turn two. Yeah, the, the hard thing is always, <laughs> why are you taking time off to play a five man enchantment, right? Can you make all your cards kind of make sense together? So there's, th but there's something there. I, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, this person that this card is very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know you like the card, David. You've already, I mean, we talked about it uh, two weeks ago, put together an is it list for this card. It's a very interesting card. All, all will be one. Somebody on Twitter asked me after that episode, they asked if we'd considered using like Harness Lightning in a Tomb with Aether as our defense and setup package because those just pick up energy counters so fast. Oh man, Harness Lightning is an awesome call. I did, I'd not considered it. So whoever that is, is a genius. The other one, I'm, a, I mean, Harness Lightning is actually a good card. The other one, I'm a little more speculative on. Well, okay, it doesn't doesn't have to be a Tomb of Ether. It could just be a Dynavolt Tower or something. I don't know. Maybe just Harness Lightning is enough by itself. Yeah, I mean, I think that sh the shell that I propose is, is actually, I think, going to be a pretty reasonable deck. And Harness Lightning, maybe even a couple of lands um, that have that have energy, um, just as a generic a way to pump up the the harness lightning and another card that can get proliferated to add counters is already worthwhile because the deck is not super color intensive mm. so I, I like that yeah definitely a sweet card challenging five mana enchantments are always challenging but uh, <laughs> yep this will, this will be a fun one what's next all right malkator purity overseer one a white and a blue one one a phyrexian elephant wizard when it enters the battlefield, create a 3-3 colorless Phyrexian Golem. And at the beginning of your end step, if three or more artifacts have entered the battlefield under your control this turn, create a 3-3 colorless Phyrexian Golem. So it starts out like a Blade Splicer, and then it has kind of this extended value you can gain on your turn, every turn, or whatever, every other turn, or whatever, if you have ways to put artifacts into play. And this card was recommended by MTG. He says, Malkator, also known as Rhinos at Home, has so much brewing potential. With just three easy steps, you two can have seven power for three-ish mana. Artifact decks have been in the far reaches of the meta and Pioneer. That is correct. Between one and bro, they are so close to breaking into the mainstream. Some of the cards worth trying with Malkator are Mishra's Research Desk, Combat Courier, and Sold Artifacts, Sahili Filigree Master. It even likes to be Blink with your Urion, Wink Wink Mord, plus Malkator Month has a great ring to it. I love this card. Uh, I have a bunch of different uh, ideas, one of which I, I just brewed up this morning, involves Sahili. So if you play three mana Sahili, you can't infinite combo with it anymore. But then you play Malkator, copy it with Sahili, that copies an artifact. Yes. Yes. So that turn four play ends up with three golems in play and a Phyrexian wizard elephant still in play. They, Unlike the Blade Splicer, they actually kind of need to kill it because it can continue making... Three threes at the end of turn if you have a way to do it. And then you still have a Sahili in play. Uh, you can put the Sahili combo in there, which is also has a bunch of artifacts. The one mana equipment that can crew Sahili and, you know, whatever, cause artifacts to trigger or whatever. I forget what it's called. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned this. Because I was just thinking about this too when I saw Malkator nominated. D. Jeff mentions the four mana Sahili, Filigree Master. But you're talking about Sahili Rai, classic Sahili. Yeah, Sahili Rai. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't. I, I have like dyslexia for card names. Oh. <laughs> the Sahili that got cat banned. <laughs> exactly. And the reason that works is because the token copy that she makes is itself an artifact. So you yes. end up with like an artifact copy of Melkator, which gets legend ruled away. Who cares? But that counts towards your three artifacts on the turn. So you end up with 10 power, right? 
Yes. Pl- your original Malkator is still there. You have 10 power. This is, it reminded me a lot of when we were trying to combine Sahili with Asika's Chariot. And, you know, you can do some tricks there where you end up with like six cats or something plus a Chariot. <laughs> this is not quite as much, but it's easier on the mana. Um, you can even fit this into modern even. Like I was thinking if I had that in the Sahili, Felidar, you know, Solitude, Fury, maybe it's a Karuga deck with A-Line Bindings defending me in Touch of the Spirit Realm or something. I mean, Melkator just sort of fits in. Like, why not? Yeah, I mean, it, it works with counter doubling. So, like, uh, Mondrak, I've been fooling around with some lists there. Mm, um, nice. It does make artifacts. Uh, you know, so we've talked, we've had a bunch, you know, I propose a bunch of <laughs> mediocre, it turns out, artifact shells. Um, I actually, in the list that I proposed at the start of the format, if you deadly dispute the ghast on turn three then play this you actually get your three artifacts that way because deadly dispute makes a treasure when you sack the ghast it makes a treasure it's mana neutral so you've uh, and you get your two cards back so you just cast this on turn three and get seven power oh that's pretty slick okay i mean yeah there's a lot to love here <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a melkator fan uh dgf mtg has brewed up a bunch of sweet five lists as well so this is my pick. You know, I don't get to vote, but uh, <laughs> at the risk of uh, altering the electorate or maybe <laughs> altering it against me, uh, this is certainly my pick. I-, I love this card. We're not playing with the Orion, though. Come on. <laughs> Gotta get more Mightstone Leak Stones in your deck, David. That's why your artifact list <laughs> yeah, exactly. is coming up short. <laughs> Next up, we have Gix, Yogmoth, Praetor, returning to the ballot for the second month in a row. Gix, one black black, legendary Phyrexian Praetor. 3-3, three, three, whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may pay a life, and if they do, they can draw a card. For 7 mana, for 4 black black black, you can also discard X cards, exile X cards from target opponent's library. You get to use those, play their lands, cast spells from among those cards. Uh, without paying their mana cost. Nominated this time by First Turn Negator, who notes that Gix was nominated last time with an emphasis on maybe that secondary ability. However, since then, Gix has helped multiple Faithless Brewers earn 5 O's across different archetypes, and we're talking about here F- First Turn Negator's own take on Demir Zombies, and D. Jeff MTGs, who we just mentioned, uh, had a white-black uh, Yorian token aggro deck that was also featuring Gix, that all happened during the discussion period last month when people were lobbying for Gix and saying it's pretty good, actually. For example, I just 5 would with it in the sweet brew. <laughs> Gix came up a little bit short. I think Gix was maybe fifth in the balloting overall. So here's another chance. Um, if you want to see sweet Gix brews, uh, you can cast your vote for Gix. First turn Gator adds that there's still a lot to explore. Move over, losing the game with seven cards in hand, and let's get back to aggro and win with seven cards in hand instead. Can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah, I knew we were doing something wrong. You're definitely, I have seven cards in hand. I got that <laughs> yeah, much. As, as long as that's <laughs> happening, it can't be that wrong. Yeah. All right, next up, an oldie but a goodie from uh, the first Eldrazi set here. Devastating Summons, one red sorcery as an additional cost to casting it, sacrifice X lands, put two XX red elemental creature tokens onto the battlefield. This is from Kilgore Trout 503, and he writes, this card can do anything, but here's some quick examples. Trigger Risen Reef, Trigger Titania, Trigger Foundry Street Denizen, Trigger Three Color Omnath, get countered so you stone rain yourself, you get the idea. Yeah, these are all uh, legal outcomes of uh, resolving... <laughs> Um, <laughs> devastating summons <laughs> trigger me because every time I see this I'm like reminded of all these awful decks that we've played over the years remember Seagate Stormcaller and this was one of the sweet things you can do with Seagate Stormcaller you can sack all your lands and get four XX creatures yeah what happened to that that sounds sweet or the new exactly. copy card that you can play uh, the two one that has to hit them twice Oh, the spell dancer. So now we have yeah. a rule of eight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, this this card is amazing. It's super unique. It only costs one, so that's that's the most important test. It's it will do what it says for the cheapest possible price. 
the uses that Kilgore chart is outlining here are ones that actually I had not properly considered, like Risen Reef, three color Omnath, uh, Titania. I mean, that's that's fascinating. The most success for devastating summons is with like Goblin Bushwhacker style cards. So yeah, eight, eight whack is where originally we see home was like a two of right. Uh, in a different era of modern, we must say, but that doesn't mean it era can't be revisited. Exactly, and that, that shell would actually use the Foundry Street then as an interaction that Kilgore's talking about. So it's a definitely a sweet card, and a tough one to think about, but like very unique, very cool. Next up is Teething Wormlet, a green mana for a 1-1 creature worm. It has death touch as long as you control three or more artifacts. I actually forgot about that line of text. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life. If this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Teething Wormlet. And the picture, of course, is a super adorable little <laughs> worm. Why it's a worm and not a dragon is kind of... It looks like a dragon, but whatever. So this card was recommended by Ignacio, who writes, Wormlet has been one of the most interesting Miracle Grow adjacent cards in recent memory. Want some sort of Silesia artifact beater? How about Pioneer Golgari Scales or even Golgari Sacrifice or outright Infinite Life with Drafna? Wormlet may not be a full build round like others, but it is a compass that directs you in the way you want to execute your wacky dreams. Again, one drops. I mean, this is the magic number. This card is going to do what it says for a cheap price. Wormlet has appeared in a couple of 5 lists in modern. One was a Hardened Scales list. One was a Asmo Food list. Nothing in Pioneer so far. I'm not sure if that's because the artifact package just doesn't make sense in green or if it's just like artifacts are underpowered in Pioneer. But it's tempting. I'm tempted. It's like a green Ingenious Smith, right? A little more aggressive. Well, it doesn't draw a card. But it's fast. It's cheap. It's true. It does all those things. It does give you life. So the thing is, I think you need to find a way to like make the life matter and the plus one plus one matter and the artifact matter. So you just have a lot of things to like consider. And if you can make all those things matter, then I think you have something sweet on your hands. I mean, Ignacio mentions comboing with Drafna. The, the way you do that is you play your Wormlet on turn one. You have a Drafna and a Mox Amber that lets you rebalance the Mox Amber over and over again for a net cost of just one mana. How do you make that go infinite? You just add a Kinnon and you're infinite. That's it. Infinite life. You could do that on turn two if you have two Mox Ambers, but the reason why I have not tried this personally is because Infinite Life is so tedious online, and it's yeah. just like, it doesn't actually win. You have to click through it a million times. So this could actually be really fun in paper and maybe just hard to test. Doesn't mean we should ignore it. Agree. And you're only playing green and blue, which in Pioneer matters a lot, right? Just playing two mm -hmm. colors means your man's actually going to be sweet. Yeah, those are Kinnon's colors. Yep. That's Kinnon's music. <laughs> All right, so next up we have Voidwing Hybrid. Blue-black creature Phyrexian bats. Flying and toxic one. Whenever you proliferate, return Voidwing Hybrid from your graveyard to your hand. Nominated for us by Daniel Barrett, who writes, Make a convincing pitch for me. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Well, it turns out Daniel... I almost nominated this card myself uh, because my wife, who occasionally likes to nominate cards because she is a, a loyal patron of the show, mentioned to me like, oh, maybe she wants to nominate a bat card this time around. And I looked at what are the playable bats in Magic. This is by far the best bat in Magic. And I nearly put it into the, uh, on her behalf, into the voting pool. But then I didn't have to because Daniel Barrett actually nominated it himself. So there it is. There's my pitch. The strongest bat in all of MTG. I also think this card is really close. Uh, the, the question is the number of prolifer proliferator effects, right? Like playing this on two, even just as a blocker, is not terrible. Like it's going to trade with most other two drops. Uh, and if it doesn't, you at least get to put the first toxic counter on them. In theory, your deck wants that to happen, right? As you proliferate, you'll, you'll probably hope to win through toxic. Maybe you have cards that only work if your opponent has three uh, poison counters. And I've, I thought of it just as like a card advantage engine. If you had a bunch of ways to just like chuck it in the bin and then proliferate and then comes back to your hand, you discard it again. So yeah, there, there's, there's something here. And there's another card that's suggested. I think any deck that includes this would include the other card. So maybe we'd get a twofer. Oh yeah, this is not the only proliferate card on the ballot this time. 
All right, so that's Void being hybrid. What's next? Next up is Michiko's Reign of Truth. Uh, Michiko is one in a white for an enchantment saga. The first and second uh, lore counters cause target creature to get plus one, plus one until end of turn for each artifact and or enchantment you control. So Michiko counts itself. It always gives at least plus one, plus one. Then the third, you exile it, and it makes a zero, zero creature that gets plus one, plus one for every enchantment artifact in play. Or is it a two, base two, two? I can't remember. I think she's just a zero, zero, Michiko. I believe so, yeah. So Ethan writes Urza's Saga 5 through 8, all the glitters, Thran Power Suit, with enough effects across both formats. Is there something other than Boggle's Auras that we can explore here? So briefly, when um, Luris was sort of a semi-dominant force in Pioneer, there was a blue-white like Scissors deck, and this was sort of Scissors 5 through 8. Uh, super powerful. If you killed it after it flipped, which you often had to do, Luris could buy it back. Um, so that was kind of the last we really saw of Machiko as like a, a format, almost a pillar, I would say, in Pioneer. Yeah, the problem is, you know, you don't want to just play a bunch of stuff just to make Machiko reasonable. You'd like all of your individual cards to be reasonably powerful, and, and that's always the question, right? So It's cheap enough and useful enough that it seems like it could be a, a piece of like a new deck whether that's like a sagas deck or like a maybe an enchantment deck or something but the thing that it's best at is pumping up an ornithopter or a ginger brute mm -hmm. it might have already been explored in, in that aspect but it is a strong card and one that you know it's kind of on the fringes so maybe we need to pay more attention to it yeah there are there is like the prototype with double strike um mm. there's the black prototype where they have to target it based on its power that has lifelink Oh, okay, I like those. So could it see play as a more like mid rangey type of card? You know, I don't necessarily love that, but that that's at least something. Actually, I like that a lot. That's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, Skrelv is now an artifact that you'll have, so... Oh, yeah, get Skrelv in there. Okay. Yeah, maybe there's actually more to discover with Machiko's, and we just kind of let it slip off the radar. Next card up is Riveteer's Ascendancy. Nominated by Deckard, Riveteer's Ascendancy is black, red, green for an enchantment. It says whenever you sacrifice a creature, you may return target creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Do it only once per turn. Deckard writes, who doesn't love three mana, do nothing enchantments? Evoke a fury, get back a grief. Play a Croxa, get back a free Ragavan. Maybe the extra value from... A sacked Fable Kiki token can tempt you into a spicy brew. It's so much value and jank all in one. I definitely agree with Deckard that this is, bizarrely, it's more of a modern card than a pioneer card, despite being a little bit weaker. The strongest natural sack effects are the Evoke Elementals, and I guess if we include Croxa here, uh, that's a stronger card in modern as well. Am I reading this right, that uh, at the end step, when you lose your Kiki Fable token, that also counts as sacrificing? Yeah, it does count that way, which is why the um, <laughs> the Humble Defector doesn't die, because you have to sacrifice it, so it goes to your opponent and doesn't have to be sacrificed. Does a token copy have a mana cost? It's a copy, right? So it should have the... Yeah, because you can't, like, Fable put Fatal Push uh, a copied 5-drop. Oh, geez, I didn't even think about that. I mean, that, that usually doesn't matter, but it, it does matter for Vintage Ascendancy and for Fatal Push. Okay. We've dabbled in this card in Modern. Weirdly enough, like, that tapped clause is <laughs> one of the more punishing aspects of the card. Like, you really, you need to have a spectacular turn the turn you cast Vintage Ascendancy that will involve these lines, like evoking elementals, but then the fact that you're left with a tapped creature means you're not stable yet, and that that's a bit of a bummer. Like, I don't know why they added that extra rider, but it is sweet. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's something you could do with the 1-1 uh, one, one lifelink creature when it comes into play from your graveyard, you get a 5-5 five, five demon, and maybe you could play like um, the, some number of Riveteer's Ascendancy, some number of um, the new three-mana Planeswalker that returns creatures from the graveyard. It's kind of replicative effects. 
And then you could play the 3-2 that makes a blood that taps to sacrifice itself. So it naturally sacrifices itself for Ascendancy. It's good with the, the Tyvar. Um, and then with Riveteer's Ascendancy oh. in play, this brings back the 1-1 uh, as a demon. The tap effect doesn't matter. It triggers and puts an untapped demon into play. And then just in general, I, I and you and I both are attracted to the idea of like, you know, whatever. Turn 1, Thought Seize, Fatal Push. Turn 2, 3-2 uh, that makes a blood. And then, you know sack it, kill their elf, play Tyvar, bring it into play, or if you have something in your graveyard, Riveteer's Ascendancy also something. I don't know, just something to think about. Okay, so we basically have a deck list now. We have <laughs> Archfiend's Vessel, Stitcher Supplier, Thought Seize, Push, maybe Shambling Guest, two mana, Blood Tithe Harvester, Fiend Artisan, maybe Priest of Forgotten Gods, three mana, Fable, Riveteer's Ascendancy, and Tyvar. That's the deck. Yeah. Adjust the numbers until you have a deck. Okay, well, that actually sounds a lot better than I thought it would when you lay it all out like that. I mean, the fact that Tyvar is like another duplicative effect, you don't have to be all in on the Ascendancy, right? Like, yeah. you can play four Tyvar, two Ascendancy, let's say. That's more Ascendancies than anyone's ever put in a Pioneer deck, and your deck <laughs> is actually pretty coherent, and you know what it's trying to do, you know what it's trying to get back. Um, Maybe you could play some three drop, like the two and a black that makes that makes a goat that sacrifices creatures or something. Like just another creature on three that you could sacrifice somehow. That would also be good with your uh, priest of forgotten gods. Okay, all right. There's so, there's something here more than I initially thought. Devil mm -hmm. as a three drop. If you're gonna have all that blood and stuff, I don't know. Something to think about. Three more cards to go. All right, Urza, Lord Protector. Urza, 2-4 for, for one, a white and a blue legendary human artificer. Artifact, instant, and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Seven mana colon if you both own and control Urza, Lord Protector, and an artifact named the Mightstone and Weakstone. Exile them, then meld them into Urza Planeswalker. Activate only as a sorcery. I won't go through what the Urza Planeswalker does. Sloth Thopterus writes... Poor old Urza. People seem to want him as a collector's item, but they don't think he can cut it in constructed play. I don't know whether we can prove them wrong, but we've got to at least try and do what the card says, so I'm nominating him for the second time. So I have done the thing. I've <laughs> put the Planeswalker into play, and I have lost those games. Like, it is... You do all this work, and you don't for sure win. That's the haunting thing. <laughs> you can't actually even be that far behind uh, for the Planeswalker to win the game for you. It's not that powerful of a Planeswalker. Interesting. Urza was on the ballot last time and actually did pretty well. So another chance for Urza, just like another chance for Gix. We'll see. I mean, yeah, if you want to do the thing, you have to put Mightstone Weakstone into your deck. <laughs> we have a template already from the Pro Tour <laughs> playing Zero Urza. <laughs> <laughs> Zero Urza, which is where I've ended up in every deck with Mightstone and Weakstone. We'll see. If the people demand it, then that's what we'll do. Yeah, you got it. You got a Democracy. Our next card is Aetherworks Marvel, parentheses, but really just the energy mechanic. Fair enough. Aetherworks Marvel, legendary artifact, costs four. Static text, whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard, you get an energy counter. You may tap and pay six energy to activate the Marvel. You look at your top six cards of your library. You may cast a card from among them without paying its mana cost. The rest go on the bottom. So in successful Marvel decks, you would try to spin the Marvel, look at your top six, and because you're casting for free, you'll, you'll get your Ulamog trigger, you'll get your Emrakul trigger. That's the dream. Uh, Judge Rob, who nominated this card, writes that they just printed a ton of proliferate. Hmm. Does energy deserve another look in Modern and Pioneer since it just got a bunch of virtual support? I listed Aetherworks Marvel, but really I'm more interested in the energy mechanic as a whole. The problem I have there is that the cards that gave you energy actually just gave you a lot of energy. So proliferating a single energy each time isn't that much more powerful strapped to some of these cards than the cards that actually gave you energy, right? So like, even if they printed a card that was one green, find a basic land and proliferate, and they printed a card that was only split card, right? Proliferate or find a basic land. That would still give you less energy than the one green mana sorcery, find a basic land, add two energy. So the proliferate isn't actually that good because the, the energy cards were so generous. That's why so many of them ended up getting um, banned in standard. 
and they haven't printed any energy support in years. Alchemy, they added like a couple energy cards, but for us paper players, <laughs> us suckers who only play with cardboard, we got nothing, right? We got no new energy cards. So unfortunately, like there's a fairly narrow pool to work with, but, but there may be something there. Like energy was so good in standard that you know, you're, you kind of wonder like maybe with treasures, you know, triggering the Marvel, maybe there's like a, some backdoor way to get to six. Maybe it's not proliferating per se, but it's just, you know, using the static text. Yeah, it could be. I mean, the, the treasures actually is more promising to me than um, specifically any proliferate effect that we've discussed. There's obviously other weaknesses, you know, Karn in a format where you're trying to uh, activate another works Marvel. We don't need to get into all that, but. I mean, maybe Etherworks Marvel is how we cast our all will be one, right? Forget about Ulamal. Well, that's what I, that's, that's, you know, it's exactly something like that where it's like you just have counters going, you know, this way and that way and you're proliferating because you're trying to do all kinds of stuff. Um, and maybe you're, you know, like Etherworks Marvel isn't trying to hit these crazy cards. It's just the cards are naturally adding tokens and then a bunch of like six mana planeswalkers that are good if Marvel cast them on four. They're good if, um, the five mana and Cham is in play. So it's almost like your duplicative effect mm -hmm. because people forget at the end, they were, people were only playing like four Ulamog and they mm -hmm. were playing like multiple, like six mana Chandra's the original six mana Chandra that like, uh, mm -hmm. I think zero to make two, three, one tramples or something with haste, mm -hmm. or maybe a plus one to do that. Then it's zero to like flip your hand and did three damage to everything. Anyway, it's much worse than the six mana Chandra we have access to now. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's the way to go. I, I actually like the sound of that more. And sticking with the proliferate theme, we have our last card, Flux Channeler. It's two and a blue for a human wizard. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate. Nominated for us by Chrisum23, who notes that it's my second attempt at getting this card across the line. However, with Poison Counters back, and in Pioneer, plus the new oil counters, I think this is easy to utilize. I think this easy to utilize proliferator is even more valuable now. Thank you. <laughs> like, what it's I activated by all non-creature spells, as Chris on 23 notes. So sagas, planeswalkers, artifacts. Uh, they mentioned Pentad Prism as a super cool, right? You can play Prism on two, this on three with two mana up. Um, you can use a counter from your Prism to trigger it, or you could play like Mishra's Bobble or something, and you've got this like crazy little ramp package. It's a very interesting card, right? It comes from War of the Spark. There's in the same set, there's Evolution Sage, which proliferates on landfall. So there's a lot of sneaky options for proliferating, you know, if we're looking at the Voidwing hybrid deck or the All Will Be One deck or the Energy deck. These are all cards in the mix. Yeah, Flux Channel are definitely pushing you towards the spells direction, but that Pentad Prism, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's pretty slick. Yeah, I'd like this Flux Channeler with the bat that we mentioned earlier. If you imagine a deck that like pieces of the puzzle on three, puts a bat in a couple other cards in your graveyard, you draw whatever, treasure cruise and a consider. Mm -hmm. We're living a magical Christmas land. Turn four, I play my Flux Channeler. I play, um, you know, a spell. I proliferate. I put my bat wing, whatever, back into my hand. Um, you know, because you, you, you kind of have a way to cascade spells for opt, for consider, for push, for treasure cruise. And then this is just another, the, the bat is a way to get the first poison counter on them. If that's how you want to win, you could just play Shieldred in this deck if you just want to draw a bunch of cards. Uh, yeah, whatever you want to do. I'm just imagining having Flux Channeler and Mind Space Apparatus in play at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, it's definitely sweet. The stats on this creature are, are not promising. <laughs> it's fragile. <laughs> it's very fragile. All right. Well, those are our 12 options this time around. Some returning favorites. Uh, a lot of interest, it looks like, in proliferating and getting different kinds of tokens and counters. And some unexplored stuff like the, the Teething Wormlet and Machiko's Reign of Truth. Looking at artifacts again. Interesting takes on Sacrifice and Devastating Summons and Rivier's Ascendancy. And of course, the sweet value from Malkator and Radadrabic. So David, to close us out, I gotta, I gotta put the question to you. 
you don't get to vote, but if you did, which three cards would you choose? I would choose Melkator. Um, I would choose Gix. And I would choose All Will Be One. Okay. Well, there you go. Good choices. Solid choices. For me, Melkator, it's hard to turn down. Uh, I think Ether works Marvel. I, I miss energy and I enjoy the challenge. I enjoy playing Ether Hub and Rogue Refiner. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm tempted by Teething Wormlet, but I think I'm going to have to go with A River Here's Ascendancy just because <laughs> that bad deck that was hastily assembled. Oh, I suckered you in with my uh, little dream there. <laughs> yeah. I know it's going to be like one of the weakest cards in the deck, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting space to brew in. All right. Well, those are the nominees. Now it's up to you. It's not up to us. It's up to you. Go cast your votes uh, if you are listening and would like to help weigh in, help us, help nudge us towards the next great card on this list. You can, of course, go sign up on our Patreon. We'll leave this vote open for about a week and we'll let you know what the people say. All right. Take care. Deck list for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for new brews with Mind Splice Apparatus, plus testing results with Atraxa Grand Unifier. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.